If you've owned a motorcycle for more than three years, this has undoubtedly happened to you. A great day, nice and warm, you're ready to go for a ride, and then this happens. Nothing. The battery's dead. It's been stored all winter, so you figure maybe it just needs a charge. And after charging it for several minutes, all you get is this. Well, looks like my bike needs a new battery. And rather than buy one that's only gonna last two to maybe three years, I'm gonna build one that lasts six to seven years. I'm Alex Grieve, and welcome to Higher Voltage. This project requires LIFEPO4 chemistry, that is lithium iron phosphate. Lithium ion and lithium polymer batteries will not work. The cell type I'll be using is known as 18650, that is 18 millimeters wide by 65 millimeters tall. Of all the places I searched for these batteries, it seemed the best selection was found at eBay, and the prices were pretty reasonable too. If there's anything consistent about lithium batteries, it's the published discharge rate of them is completely bogus. I figure I'll need about six sets of cells in parallel to comfortably crank the bike. Since I'll need four sets in series to make 12.8 volts, I'll need 24 batteries. I'll need two other items to complete this project. The first is a battery management system, or a BMS. In the drone world, we call this a battery balancer. It keeps the cells at the same voltage so that they don't overcharge or over discharge them. Then the other thing I'm going to need is a nickel strip. This is to connect the cells together. I can use wire, but the nickel strip is just much more convenient and more compact. I'm going to need a case to hold my new battery, and, well, the old battery fits the bill. The only thing I'll have to do is get the acid out. Just dump the acid into any bucket after pulling the plugs. No surprise, this one was just about bone dry. A Sawzall does a good job of cutting right through the plastic and the lead connections. Yeah, I probably should be using safety glasses here, but yeah, I wasn't really thinking. The cells inside are made of lead covered with sulfuric acid, so it's probably not a good idea to touch them. I, again, should be using safety equipment, this time gloves. There's still a fair amount of acid inside the battery stuck to the walls, so I'm just going to rinse it out with a garden hose, trying to keep my hands away from what's coming out. I'm going from a 6-cell lead acid battery to a 4-cell lithium phosphate battery, so I need to cut down four of these five walls to half height. I heated the plastic up, then cut through it with a knife. However, in hindsight, I should have used a Sawzall. To cut the horizontal cut, I'd simply use a Dremel tool. Here you can see how the lithium batteries fit inside the old lead acid case. This battery is going to be made from four sets of six cells. I'm going to split this into two groups of three with a cardboard spacer in between. The cardboard is approximately the same width as the old cell dividers in our battery case. Then I just wrap them up with masking tape to hold them together. Before adding my nickel strips, I'm going to have to add solder to the pads of the battery in order to give the nickel strips something to bond. You'll note that I flipped over one set of batteries here. That's because each of these sets of six batteries gets connected in series, four of them total, to make a 12.8 volt battery. You'll want to get the pad of the battery good and hot in order to get the solder to flow and bond solidly to the battery. Don't worry about overheating it here, just be sure you get a good solder bond. Cut your nickel strip to size with a pair of household scissors, then lay it across the cells, making sure the cells are nice and lined up. Then, just like you added solder to the tops of the batteries, now you're going to add it to the tin strip. You'll want to be sure the solder gets good and hot and liquefies, and then makes a solid bond. You do not want a cold solder joint, or it will cause arcing within the battery. Once the solder is liquefied underneath the tin strip, use a metal tool to press down so the tin strip rests solidly on the top of the battery while the solder cools. In hindsight, I should have left a little bit of the nickel strip hanging off each end of the battery set. While this isn't required, it gives the battery a lower internal resistance, which means more cold cranking amps and a better engine start. It will also give me a place to hook my BMS system up to. Once the nickel strips are good and bonded, simply fold the battery in half on top of itself. Then, take a soldering iron between the pads that are extended past the battery set and add a little bit of solder. Then, when the solder is liquefied and both pads are hot, use a pair of pliers to pinch these together solidly. Now I need to connect the negative sides of the batteries together. 
I'm using single strips for this because they have to split over the dividers inside the motorcycle battery. The technique here is the same. Tin the ends of the battery up with solder, then add the nickel strip over top and get the nickel strip good and hot so the solder liquefies underneath. Use a metal tool to hold it in place and then remove the soldering iron and let the solder dry. You'll need to do this to each side of the battery set. This will leave you with two negative bus leads. The next step is to add a set of wire leads. These will extend outside of the battery case so that you can connect them to your motorcycle. You'll want to use a good heavy gauge wire. In this case, I'm using 12 gauge. Strip about half of an inch of insulation off of your battery leads and then solder them onto your nickel strips. Now you'll want to solder on your BMS wires. These can be a thin gauge, such as 22 gauge, since they won't take that much current. Solder one wire to your ground bus and solder to the other wire to one of your extended tabs. I'm taping over the ends of my wires to prevent an accidental short. I'm using masking tape over the BMS wires and then I'll label them with what terminals they go to. The wire connected to the negative terminal is B-. The one connected to the tab is B-1. Repeat this process for your other set of 12 batteries. However, this time you'll want to connect your individual nickel strips to the positive end of the batteries. Again, get the battery terminals good and hot and make sure that the solder is liquefied underneath the nickel strip to be sure that you get a good bond. I'm using red wire for my battery leads on this end to denote that this is the positive end of the battery. This set of cells will require two BMS wires as well. The wires connected to the positive lead will be B4 and the one connected to the tab will be B3. Now the masking tape and the cardboard spacers can be removed and the cell sets can be inserted into the battery case. If not already done, go ahead and tin up all of the remaining battery tabs. Cut another set of nickel strips to jump across the gap between the battery sets and then solder this solidly in place. Again, be sure to heat this up thoroughly so that the solder underneath the nickel strip liquefies. Solder another small wire to this strip to connect to the BMS. This is B2, the center of the BMS system. Solder each wire to the respective terminal on the BMS system. Be very careful here. The battery is now live and hot, so be careful not to bridge any solder joints or you could short the battery out. While a short is unlikely to damage the battery, it will most certainly destroy the BMS pads. In order to keep the BMS from moving around, I simply taped it to the battery. This is a little bit of added security because if that board shifts, it could create a short between my soldering iron and another pad. Once everything is all soldered up, add a little bit of hot glue or silicone over the pads and extend it over the wires. This provides both insulation and a little bit of strain relief, so when the board is shoved inside the battery, it doesn't short out nor do the wires get damaged. You'll want to make a top for your new battery. A Tupperware lid works great, however, I have access to a CNC laser and ABS, so I fabricated this lid. The DXF files are available in the video description below. I'm using a small amount of hot glue to secure it in place as a semi-permanent installation that can still be removed if needed. Trim your lead so that they only extend through the lid about an inch, and then you'll want to strip off approximately half of an inch of insulation. At the ends of these wires, you'll connect ring terminals. I found 10 gauge ring terminals at my local automotive store. Rather than crimp them in place, I'm going to solder them. This is a seven to eight year battery, so I prefer a much stronger connection that won't get weathered over time. Most ring terminals are nickel or tin plated, so they accept solder readily. Be sure to get it good and hot and make sure that the solder wicks all the way down through the ring terminal and coats the wires completely. Add a little bit of electrical tape or heat shrink tubing to the base of the ring terminals just to be sure you don't short out the battery to the frame of the motorcycle. And last but not least, be sure to label your battery terminals so you don't get them crossed. To hook up to your motorcycle, the ring terminals act just like battery terminals. Just use a regular bolt. In my case, I'm using a 6mm bolt and a nut. Normally you connect the ground lead first, but in my case, my bike doesn't allow that. And there you have it, a better battery than you can buy for less than the cost of a cheap lead acid. I'm Alex Greve, and this is Higher Voltage.